Okay, after working today on our proofs with segments and angles, remember if you get stuck on something, refer to the um, second and third page in your notebook, and that's like a giant um, word bank for you. And so we're going to break down these proofs, and I'm going to show you some tips and tricks to get through this. Remember, um, you can use symbols and abbreviations, but you got to make sure that we understand what they mean. So if I abbreviate something, just make sure you understand what that stands for. Um, if you don't remember that, then go ahead and write out the full word. Okay, so it's very important to start looking at your given and prove at the very beginning. And if there is a picture, go ahead and label what was given from the picture so we can understand the path that we're going to take. So it says B is the midpoint of AC. So that means if B is right in the middle, then segment AB is congruent to segment BC. And you can see that in your proof. They state that. Then they also gave us that segment AB is congruent to segment EF. Well, now that we mark all that, we can see that everything is congruent to each other in this picture, and that's what we're trying to prove, that segment BC is also congruent to EF. So let's break this down and justify every step. Um, the one thing that we're never going to miss and we're always going to take care of first are our givens, and we can see here that I have one given here, and another given here. So find those in your proof. I see the first given here, and I see the second given down here. It doesn't mean they have to be first and second. You've gotta look and see where they're written. So we know that we can go ahead and put the word given beside them. Okay, that was given to us. And so now we look at step, um, step two. How did we know, based on our picture, that segment AB was congruent to segment BC? Well, it was because they told us that we had a midpoint. And so anytime they spell out a word to you, that's your hint. Because on the next line or somewhere below it, they're going to tell you the definition of a midpoint. And the definition of a midpoint is that you have two congruent segments. So we knew that segment AB was congruent to BC because we had a definition of a midpoint. All right, so there's that. Now we look at get the given statement AB was congruent to EF. And so now I know that all three are congruent. I can say that segment BC is congruent to EF also. And that is by the transitive property. Remember the transitive property, what you're going to remember is to cut out the middleman. And in this case, we're taking out our ABs. So if BC is congruent to AB and EF is also congruent to AB, if they're congruent to the same thing, then we can cut out that middleman and say that BC is also congruent to EF. And there is that proof. Okay, let's look at the second example here. Again, start with your givens and look at your picture. We can see that AC equals AB plus AB. Well, I don't see AB twice in my picture. So we have to think about that it's going to take two ABs to equal all of AC. Um, we're trying to prove that AB is equal to BC. So I do know that when I see a segment like this this year, we have used something like this, part plus part equals whole, and that's your segment addition postulate, which we're probably going to have to use in this proof. So again, I was have one given. I see that given here, so let's go ahead and take care of that. The next one says AB plus BC equals AC. Well, I can see that AB is a part, BC is a part, and AC is the whole thing. There's your segment addition postulate. Okay, now if you look here, we, they were told us that AB plus AB equals AC. Could we substitute that in from the previous one and say that AB plus AB is the same as saying AB plus BC by substitution. Okay, and then if you take step four and say, okay, well that means that AB has to equal BC, that BC is probably gonna be the midpoint. If we take away an AB from each step, that means that we used subtraction. So again, you're looking from step by step what happens in the previous step to get us the next step, and that's going to help you out on this. Okay, let's look at example three. 
Again, let's start with our um, givens. We have two here. So B is the midpoint of AC, which means this segment AB is congruent to segment BC. C is also a midpoint of BD, so BC is congruent to CD. So we are trying to prove that all three of those are congruent and that we can cut out our middleman here. There's a hint to you that AB is congruent to CD. That's what we're trying to prove here. So if you notice this one, we do have two givens, but they put them in the same line, and that's okay. Sometimes they'll separate them, sometimes they won't. You just kind of have to look at what was given to you in your table. Okay, so if we know from the first step that B is the midpoint of AC, we can make the statement that segment AB is congruent to segment BC. So let's go ahead and write that. Segment AB is congruent to segment BC. But they gave us two midpoints, so then we would say that segment BC is congruent to segment CD. Make sure, because we're talking about segments, that you're putting the symbol over it. And we are using the congruent symbol because the definition of a midpoint is that it gives you two congruent segments, so we have to write it correctly. Now, if you look from step two to step three, the only thing that's different is they took the line over it and they took the congruent symbol off. So now they're saying that you have equal segments. Well, if you look at your list of definitions, um, then you can see that the definition of congruent segments is that you have equal segments, and that's what it says. So anytime you're going from congruent to equal or equal to congruent, and that's the only change, that's going to be definition of congruent segments. So you might want to highlight that just to sh remind yourself on why we did that. That was the only change there, going from congruent to equals. And so then going from step three to step four, what did they do? They got rid of these BCs, and so that's your middleman there. And so we know that we use the transitive property to prove that segment AB is equal to segment CD. Okay, now we're gonna switch over to angles. A lot of this stuff is the same. We're just using the word angles instead of segments now. Um, we could also get into words like right angles, supplementary angles, complementary angles, things like that. But a lot of the other properties that we've talked about with substitution and transitive, those still apply. So let's look at our givens. We can see that we were given two. A, B is, um, angle A and angle B are supplementary. We know that supplementary means that they add up to 180, so let's make a note of that. We were also given here that angle A equals 45, and so we're trying to prove that angle B equals 135. Now, I know that's a simple subtraction problem for you, but again, proofs are trying to justify why something works the way it does. It's not just a simple answer. It's an explanation of why we get 135. Okay. So we were given two given, so let's find those. I can see the first one is right here, and the second one is right here. So let's go ahead and stick given by both of those. Okay, now the definition of supplementary is that two angles add up to 180 degrees. Well, that's what I see happening in step three. And again, we said back at the beginning, if they spell out a word to us, that means we've got to use the definition. So always refer back to that definition page and you can see two angles that add up to 180, which is step three. So right here, we would put definition of supplementary angles. Now, notice what happened going from step three to step four. The only change they made was right here. They switched out angle A to 45. So if they make a switch or they plug something in, then remember that is substitution. And then we can see going from four to five, what did they do with the 180 and 45? They subtracted and they got the 135. Okay, again, it's just like a puzzle. Just figure out what's happening from step to step. 
Okay, let's look at the next one. We only have one given here. Angle EDG is congruent to angle FDH. So I'm gonna highlight this just so you can see and rem remind us how to um, identify which angle is which. EDG, connect ED to G, okay? And then FD to H. So they're saying that those two angles are congruent. Look at where the overlap is happening, angle two. That to me looks like a middleman situation is going to happen, so we're probably going to use the transitive property to prove that angle one and three are congruent. Okay, so let's find our given statement. I see that it is the first one, so let's go ahead and write given. Then what did they do going from step one to step two? The only difference I see here is that congruent to equals. Remember that is definition of congruent, and now we're gonna say angles, not segments. So definition of congruent angles. Okay, now let's look at three. Angle one plus angle two equals all of angle EDG. Well, that looks like a part plus part equals whole situation. And so if we see a part plus part equals whole, then we know that is the angle addition postulate. We're gonna abbreviate this. If you look at step four, I see the same thing. Two angle two plus angle three equals FDH. That's another part plus part equals whole situation. So again, we have another angle addition postulate. And now look what they did going from step four to step five. Do you see how they just made a switch for one of those to show because the angles are congruent, you can just plug in those numbers. So looking at step one, I'm gonna circle that in blue, look at step one. If we know one plus two equals EDG and two plus three equals FDH, we can substitute those in. So let's say this is substitution. And then what happens going from step five to step six? I see that they're taking that middleman of two like we talked about at the beginning. They're cutting it out, so that is your transitive property. And what do you see going from step six to step seven? The only difference here is going from equal to congruent. Now notice this one's backwards from step one to step two. It does not matter what order they go in. If you're going from congruent to equal or equal to congruent, it's always going to be definition of congruent either segments or angles. So definition of congruent angles. Okay, last example here. So why don't you take a minute, pause the video, and I want you to... See if you can do this one on your own. You're gonna take those statements, put them in the correct order, and then you're gonna take your reasons and put those in the correct order and see how you do. So go ahead and pause your video, try it, and then hit play and let's see how we do. Okay, hopefully you paused it and you tried it on your own. So let's see how you did. We have two givens, okay? I see those are right here and right here. So let's go ahead and bring those into one and two. Doesn't matter the order you put them in. There's a couple of different ways you could do this. And I'm gonna abbreviate. See, the other one was angle A is congruent to angle C. Okay, so let's break this down for a minute. Oh no, before we do that, let's go ahead and put our givens. You should have already done that. We know that angle A and B are complementary, and hopefully you looked up that definition. It said two angles add up to 90 degrees, and so if A and B are 90, we know that they are complementary, then they add up to 90, so we can bring the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B equal 90 degrees, and we knew that because the definition of complementary angles. Lots of abbreviating here, and that's okay. Now, we don't really have anywhere else to go with that, so let's go to our other given. Well, we know that if they give us something about congruent angles, we need to state that they're equal to each other. So we would say the measure of angle A equals the measure of angle C. And if we're going from congruent to equal, 
Then remember that's definition of congruent angles. Okay, so we've now taken care of this one, this one, this one, and our other given. So we have the step one and step four left to put in their place. Well, I can't say that C and B are complementary yet till I know for sure that they add up to 90 degrees. So I'm going to bring that step one down because now that I know A and C are equal to each other, we can make that switch and we can plug in C where A was and we can say measure of angle C plus the measure of angle B equals 90 degrees. Again, we're just making that switch in right here. And so if you make a switch, that's substitution. And now that we know that they equal 90 degrees, we can now state the proof that they are complementary. So angle C and angle B are complementary. And how did we know that? Because we know that they added up to 90, so definition of complementary angles. Hopefully you did well on that one. If not, let's figure out where we went wrong by looking at mine and just following your steps. Remember, if you get stuck while you're working, refer to your um, second and third page of your notebook. It's just like a giant um, word bank for you and solve those puzzles. So 